just that sense of feeling so insecure about your place in the universe. It is probably why I'm so interested in wealth literature and ideas about success today. It, it originates, and I'll say this quite openly, from a place of insecurity and a place of fear. So the whole topic of money is bound up in emotions, it's bound up in ideology, but the downside to that is we make the mistake of not talking about it around the dinner table. We come to the conclusion that it is inappropriate, and I think that is entirely the wrong way to look at it. I think the most effective families sit and have open discussions about wealth and about money and about finances, goals and aspirations, and they do it without shame and without qualms. Now, the fascinating thing about that, I don't think you have to have the right answers <clears throat> when you are sitting around a, a family table and, and discussing money. I think the discussion itself is the important part. And the reason I say that is that the answers change over time. Mm. As industries evolve, as thoughts about money change, as investing changes, the answers are going to change. So it's not imperative on us as, as parents, for example, to have the right answers, but it is important to ask the right answers questions and to have our kids asking the right questions and confronting these ideas. I think that's terrifically important. And you know what? I, now that I'm adult, right? Well, you know, I'm still childish, but when I was growing up in school, right? The way they teach you about money is completely false and wrong. And it's like a fairy tale land sort of a thing. Um, you yeah. know, you, you have to get a good job and then you need to save a percentage of that money. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, hopefully you get a nice interest rate. And it's all like hopefully, maybe, possibly, potentially, yeah. you know, all kinds of things. When I was an adult, you know, studying how to sort of like increase your your wealth, not 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 money per se, but, but to generate wealth, right? Because mm. wealth is something that shouldn't run out. Uh, money, mm -hmm. you know, tends to you've got money now and then you don't. Um, but when they teach you in school about money, what they teach you is not what the reality is. Because like, for example, yeah. in, in, in business, uh, in school, they would teach me that uh, for a product, right? You charge for, you take into account the basic cost of the parts, uh, you mm -hmm. add labor cost, and then you add like 25% of the total and that's your profit margin. Yes. What reality yes. tells me is like people will pay for something they perceive as valuable. So it's not uh -huh. the actual value, but the perceived value of something, right? I mean, and, and you've hit the nail on the head there. I mean, that, that is the heart and soul of what I've spent the last 15 years doing as a speaker and author. It's that concept of value. And there are many ways in which you can multiply your value. Let's take a couple of simple examples from our world as, as speakers and coaches. Mm. You, you've, again, hit the nail on the head there. The issue of perception. If you are perceived to be a high-level person who gets good results, your fee is exponentially more than that of someone who works equally hard. So it is not tied to how hard you work. It is tied to the perception of value. But there are other ways of multiplying your value as well. I mean, just take the example of a YouTube star. You've got these young kids these days, I think this is fascinating to watch, mm. playing video games on YouTube, rack, ranking up millions of views and buying yachts with their proceeds. <laughs> now, there is no link between how hard they are working and how much they are earning. There, there's none right. whatsoever. What it, what's happening there is the multiplication of value. The idea of being entertained by someone watching a video game for an hour or two online may have X amount of value for one individual but times that by a few million individuals around the world, and each YouTube video becomes worth extraordinary amounts of money. We saw that even outside of the digital world with someone like Charles M. Schultz, the, um, the author right, of the- Right, right, yeah. Yeah, it's just fabulous. You go and have a look at Forbes' list of the um, wealthiest posthumous earners for the past few years, which is their fancy way of saying richest celebrity dead guy. And at number- <laughs> <laughs> Number three, you've got Charles Schultz. It's, if I remember correctly, it, it alternates every year between Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley. And at number three is Charles Schultz. Now, the man worked for an hour every day. But what he did was he drew this popular little, little comic strip that then sold to thousands of newspapers around the world, multiplying the value. So, yes, as you mentioned there, the ideas that we learned in school are the very basics of business. It is almost a cardboard caricature of what mm. can be done. It's the safe version, but it's one option and it's a disappearing option. We, we don't generally think that way anymore. These days, businesses tend to think in terms of multiplying and exponentially multiplying the value. 
And that's what we're after. Now, the next thing that schools teach, and this tends to hit the students and, and catch them off guard when they get to the high levels of, of high school and they start entering varsity, is the more socialist ideas around businesses, which basically have one flawed premise at their heart and soul, which is wealth is a finite pool and you come and take your little bit. And the implied thinking is that if a large organization is earning a huge amount of money, then it's taking a lot of that pool away. Now, the fallacy in that is that businesses don't take from a finite pool. They generate. And that's the part that we're interested in. If it were the case that there is a finite pool of wealth and all of the players come along and take their bit away from it, that would imply that at some point in time, all of the wealth that ever existed already existed. Yet, if you look at world economies, they are growing every year. So someone is wrong here. And I suspect it's the, the socialist teachings that we're perpetuating in uh, at varsity level. And I think it's extraordinarily dangerous. It results in this idea of, of young people thinking that capitalism is inherently evil. And there are, there are several problems about that.